Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. The Commonwealth Club, uh, my name is Adam Hirschfelder. I am with the programming team here at the club. We're excited uh, to have you all here for a lot of reasons. I think this is our fourth live program this week, which is uh, really exciting. Thank you. One of our, busy, one of our busiest in-person weeks we've had, of course, in two years. But over those two years, we've become also a digital uh, provider of content. And not only do we have the crowd here, and we thank you everyone here who is here in person, but also those who are watching online in the Bay Area, of course, but also we have new friends around the country, so hello to them. I say that, one, to welcome everyone, but two, to, let, to ask you, for those who have phones, please turn them off, because you'll not only bother your folks inside the room, but people watching online. So please do that. It also gives me a chance to ask members, who here are members of the Commonwealth Club? Okay, that's about half, and it seems most of the members are on this side. <laughs> <laughs> so that means the folks on this side, but if you're not a member, that means you can be. And it's a great time to be a member of the club because we're going to be doing more and more in-person programs as we ramp back up to normal, which is just really great and exciting for all of us. I think my colleague, Billy Bean, back there, Billy Bean, can answer any questions you have about membership at the Commonwealth Club. So talk to Billy after this. So we've told you to turn off the phones. I've made the membership pitch. And now I get to introduce two exciting guests. I couldn't be more pleased to have uh, John Markoff in conversation with Paul Safo. Uh, John has been here several times, and as we talked about, hasn't been here in a few years. But uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce John Markoff and Paul Safo <laughs> to talk <laughs> about John's new book. Good. So. Welcome, everyone. Uh, hello and good evening, as, as we say in Commonwealth Club tradition. I'm delighted to be back here and particularly delighted uh, to be back here in person. I think some of us thought this would uh, never, ever happen again. And also delighted that the Commonwealth Club is, is coming back to in-person events. And before I go further, I should mention that you can learn more about all of the club's in-person events and programs at uh, www.commonwealthclub.org. And, you know, it's interesting as I say that, John, I think about your role in first breaking the news about the World Wide Web so very long ago. But I, I digress. <laughs> um, so let me just say a word about John. I know everybody in this room probably knows John already, but the way I think about it is there, there are two kinds of journalists. There are journalists who break stories, and then there are journalists who reveal and interpret the deeper currents running through our zeitgeist, often long before they become breaking news. And you can have one or the other. John is the rare person who is both kinds of journalists. Uh, he's broken more than his share of stories, uh, from being the first to tell us about the first major internet virus, the Morris worm. And he's also not only broken, but been in stories uh, such as the case with Kevin Mitnick in 1995 and uh, uh, some, some computer crimes. And um, he wrote the first uh, public article about the World Wide Web in 1993. And he also broke the story that Google was secretly driving cars in the wild on California freeways. John, however, also excels at revealing and exploring the deeper trends. And uh, many of us have come to rely upon his insights over the years. I find myself in my business relying on, on what he writes. And doing that is really no small feat because from, for me as an observer, watching him write these deep stories nobody had written about before often seemed to involve bamboozling the New York Times editors into running a piece, even though it wasn't, quote, news in the conventional sense of what the gray lady covered. He's also been a pioneer in shaping how we cover technology. I think when you joined the Times in 1988, John, that the dominant paradigm at the newspaper was that technology reporting was uh, somewhere next to um, the uh, dining section and reporting on new product reviews. John played a major role in changing that 
and turning tech coverage into something that was no longer gizmos but about issues. He has also lived through the unnerving fact that the technology he was covering as he was covering it uh, was utterly changing the media world he worked in and the tools he worked with, which I think of as sort of a, it's a fleet feat comparable to piloting an airplane through a really severe thunderstorm while all the engineers, software engineers, of course, are sitting in back arguing about what the shape of the wings should be and air traffic control is shouting from the ground, you're going to crash. Um, so he's lived through this revolution and has perfectly qualified him to write this very remarkable book, Whole Earth, which uh, how many people have looked at it already? A couple, it is really good. Um, and the thing I find fascinating about the book is it's a biography, of course. Um, but it's as much a biography of a half century of transformational change that had its locus here in California as it is a biography of an absolutely astonishing uh, individual. And I should add, it's a biography about a transformation that is far from over. So enough about you, sir. Let's talk about the book. <laughs> Let's talk about Stuart. <laughs> um, uh, so I checked with Stuart in advance, and he has a question for you, and the question is, um, so what do you think about biographies now that you've written one? <laughs> well, to, to be perfectly honest in responding to that, I was, I, and I have not completely set down the idea of writing another one. Um, I think we've talked about, who, uh, you know, the first, my, my first... Um, so suspense, we'll save that for questions and you can ask him <laughs> which one he's thinking of and but hopefully talk him out of it. I also wrote a biography about someone who's still living, which is an interesting... Um, uh, and moreover, you should say a biography about someone still living who is astonishingly documented. Well, yeah. When I set out to work on this project, I discovered there were more than two dozen books that already dealt in one way or another with Stewart's biography, bits or pieces of it. And they almost all used it to try to make one case or another about technology or society. Well, I was thinking the other part of the documentation. You mean Stewart's documentation? The, all our archives. Well, so, yeah, so it turns out that the, 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 the real piece of luck in all of this, the, the lesson that I learned in becoming a biographer is you have to have contemporaneous documents or just don't bother. Because although I think Stewart has a reasonably good memory, um, he's 83 now, um, we were talking about events that in some cases were 60 years or more ago, and in, in places things got noticeably sketchy. And he would say, go talk to this person or go talk to that person. And half the time, they weren't alive anymore. So that was kind of challenging. And so luckily, he was also a pack rat. And uh, Stuart, for uh, decades on the Sausalito waterfront, had just been tossing stuff into a shipping container, literally. And in 2000, <laughs> in 2000 the Stanford librarian sh showed up. And they took almost all of it down to Stanford. And uh, you know what shocked him, both myself and Fred Turner were in there immediately after he he, he gave them his papers to read his journals. He didn't expect anybody to be interested then. And since then, there's been a steady stream of people who've been reading his papers. But it's, it's not just journals. It's his uh, correspondence, and it's all the sort of ephemera of the stuff he was doing. And uh, really, I mean, really, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fun stuff. Um, but the challenge of uh, sort of following Robert Caro's dictum of turn every page, um, you know, I spent a year and a half in there, and I think I got through it all. Um, but the, the real challenge is that I had to cross this sort of phase change boundary from the print world to the digital world. And um, the print world is relatively well organized. The digital world is a mess. You can't even figure out what a page is in the d digital world to turn it. And there aren't good tools for looking at stuff. Um, people didn't really care about email in the early days. I mean, the early decade of email is just a mess. Go back and try to find your old email. It's McLuhan-esque. The way people communicated changed across the boundary. Um, there were these wonderful letters where you sort of you know, pour out your heart to your friends. Those all sort of more or less went away in the, in the digital era. So now when you saw that, because, well, say a word about Stewart's habit of keeping journals and how early he started that. So, yeah, so his journals go back to high school. Um, and I think he started journaling at, at the urging of one of his teachers in high school. 
Yes. And he was, he, he's been very consistent all the way through. And shockingly self-reflective. Well, in, so the, yes, but when you get that, in, in some places, the, the journals are everything a biographer would die for. Um, you know, details on what happened during the day kind of stuff and the reflective stuff. And in other places, things got really sketchy. He was into psychedelic drugs for about seven years. And things were very sketchy at points. And you're going, where? <laughs> what, what have I got? So, there, you know, there were ups and downs. But by and large, there was some, a lot of stuff. So that transitioned when things went digital, like Stuart co-founding the well, and you had to deal with the well messages. The well Your stuff has got a lot more complicated. The well stuff is gone. Um, there, they, you know, archivally, the digital archive is just missing for. I, at this point, I don't remember how many years, but not only was the problem. So for a while, he was. There was a period when he communicated via a system called Eyes, which was a very early on. Very Turoff, New right. Jersey Institute of Technology. Yeah, this is sort of the early 1980s, maybe late 1970s even. Yeah, it was late 70s. Stuart, Stuart was actively using it in the early 80s, and then there was a period where he was using a well address. And that stuff just is not around. And so there's, there's you know, it, it may be somewhere I didn't find it. I, I made some efforts to find it. And uh, the well and Stuart told me it didn't exist. But then it gets even more complicated because people began using um, the mail systems that came with their operating system, whether it's Macintosh or Windows. He was a Mac guy. And there are just horrific problems in his inbox. It's, it's stored in a particular um, in a particular format, and it got completely munged in moving from one computer to another computer. And the Stanford librarians are actually beginning to build tools to work on digital stuff, um, to, to, do, to, to sort of bring stuff out. And, and they spent a lot of time. These people are much more skilled at computing than I am. And you know, there's stuff that's going to be just going to be missing. Sure. And, and we should put in a good word for Stanford University libraries. They really are global leaders in this area, coming up with systems like locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe and paying attention to archives and Silicon, Dilli Silicon yeah. Valley digital archives. I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, I have questions, as you can tell already. I'm guessing you all have questions as well. I believe there are cards in the room that you can write down your questions. Just write them down as it occurs to you, and they'll get sent up to me. And for folks out in uh, cyberspace, if you put your questions into the chat box on uh, YouTube, uh, they will be magically dispatched to us and we'll get them up here in about 25 minutes when we open it up to general conversation. Um, you know, your comment about how it changed things, I think of Stuart in your book, you mentioned how that moment when Stuart quit the well and, and he was dismayed by all the arguments and then he realized, I think the insight was that it wasn't the people, it was the medium that caused it. Yeah, so, so Stuart had some experience with anonymous communication from eyes, where they'd done these experiments in anonymity, and they'd immediately gone sideways, and people had begun to treat each other in really horrible ways. And so he was alert to that when he designed the will, and he tried to design it so there wouldn't be anonymous interaction, and, he, but he made it possible to communicate pseudonymously, pseudonymously. You could have multiple personalities in your well account. And it turned out there was the same kind of behavior in ways. And at a certain point, it was, it was about six years into to the, to the well, which was this small online community that, that grew and had a particular flavor of both sort of Marin County and the Grateful Dead. And uh, Stuart also did this brilliant move as a, as a marketing guy, he basically gave uh, free accounts to technology reporters like myself and Stephen Levy and other people. And so we all hung out there. And as a result, the well got this out of scale reputation in the world. Because, um, you know, by that time, there were already, uh, you know, huge online services like AOL. Uh, well, AOL was, uh, no, a AOL came later. But came there, later, but, but that's there was what started causing the well to. That's right, there was, the growth shifted. But there was, there was CompuServe, uh, there was the source, there was Prodigy, and there, there was also this Usenet world where all the Unix computer centers in the, in the world talked to each other. And so the, the well was part of, part of a process. A anyway, at a certain point, the well experienced growing pains. And Stuart was seen as part of management. He was, he was the founder, and he was on the board. And he took a, 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 a virtual beating. And after a while, he just said, life's short. I'm doing other things. I resign. And he walked away from it. Um, it's interesting because you know, one of the charges against Stuart is he's a technology optimist. And 
um, you could see how badly um, he was, he felt by the way he was treated by the community, but he chose not to go public with it. I mean, he walked away, but he didn't make a big deal out of it. And in fact, it's kind of ironic. One of the things that, that he said, even though he knew about the eyes experience in, in 1985 when he started the will, he was interviewed in KQED Focus magazine. And there's this big pull quote in which Stuart says, you know, computer communication suppresses your animal instincts. When you're on a computer, you communicate like an angel. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he must just cringe at the fact that he said that. Right. <laughs> the danger of being a futurist. So <laughs> the, the, your, your comment, I mean, Stuart um, has been accused of being an optimist. Um, but how would you describe it? I, I think of it as he projects relentless optimism, but uh, I think privately. Yeah, I could see in his journals, he was often a, aware of, of, of things or speculated even about things. And particularly, there's a passage um, in his journal. Uh, this, this is sort of, I think, when he was writing uh, his book on the Media Lab, so a little bit later, where he talked about where things might go wrong in the communications world. And he raised the specter of a massive disinformation campaign in 1997. That was in his journal. He didn't basically come public and, and, and say anything about it. But, you know, the thought crossed his mind. So, a pragmatist? Well, I, I, you know, he certainly thinks of himself as a pragmatist. He's been labeled a utopian. And uh, he winces when people call him a utopian. I think it's actually fair to call him uh, a pragmatist. Uh, you know, Stewart iterates on things. Ideas bubble up and then they, uh, and they, they, they will, he'll cogitate them on, sometimes for decades uh, before he'll do things. I mean, I saw the first evidence of the well in 1968 when he was hanging out with Doug Engelbart's NLS crew um, in Menlo Park, and he came up with the uh, notion of doing basically the well, and he called it E-I-E-I-O, and I can't remember what E-I-E-I-O was, what, but he had, he had a, you know, he's great at aphorisms and, and acronyms and things like that. Well, and I also think, I mean, Stuart right now is heads down on his book about maintenance. He's as vital and busy as ever. And as I was reading your book, it was a reminder that, you know, he was talking about maintenance way back in the early 90s when he was working on how buildings learn. And as I recall, it got him into a lawsuit in England when he correctly pointed out that, I mean, we won't mention the name of the architect because I don't want to get sued. <laughs> Um, the architect thought it'd be a really great idea to put all of the HVAC and the Pumpy Do Center on the outside of the right. building, and they promptly discovered why that was a bad <laughs> idea, and Stuart pointed it out. So he's yeah. been ticking over the maintenance thing for 30 years. Yeah, so, so you know, when, when I left the Times in 2017 and Kevin Kelly approached me and said, you know, someone should write a biography of Stuart, Stuart had been thinking about writing an autobiography a couple of years, and at that point he decided he didn't have the energy for it. I think he had plenty of energy. He just didn't want to muck around in his own life. And so he left that to me. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the idea of writing an autobiography of a life as diverse as his, especially given that he's such a good writer, would be a little bit like an orthopedic surgeon performing <laughs> arthroscopy on their own knee. Technically, they could do it, but it'd be hard to see through the pain. Um, <laughs> But speaking of that, uh, as, as I recall, I think you told me that you had about 60,000 words cut out of the book? Well, y yes, I did. Uh, so the first, dra the first draft... Uh, By the way, it was only the vowels. They left all the consonants. <laughs> no, the, um, the contract that I signed uh, was for a 75,000-word book, and we knew I wasn't going to write a 75,000-word book, but it, it sort of ballooned. There, the 60,000 words, there are lots and lots of things that I am very cl close to anecdotally that are not in the book that sort of fell on the floor. And I actually couldn't do it myself. I couldn't bring myself to do it. I knew I couldn't cut 60,000. And so I, I uh, hired a guy by the name of Jeff Chandler, um, who's an excellent uh, editor, and he did the sort of vicious work of taking things out. So what was, what was the neatest thing that was cut <laughs> out? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know, Stuart was around in the 1970s, um, uh, in the 60s when uh, sort of the, the attitude about um, uh, sexual behavior was very different. And there, there are a number of stories like that that vanished one way or another. I probably won't tell them here on the stage. <laughs> this is a family program. Uh, yes. 
Well, you know, speaking of that, there's also in Stuart's vol voluminous archives at Stanford, there is a missing journal or a, a concealed journal. Well, yeah, so, so it wasn't missing. Well, now you're talking about what I call the lost journal, the journal that he didn't give, or are you talking about this other issue? Uh, well, actually, we can cover both. Okay, well, we, we yeah, because I feel, I feel very they, sorry. Should we skip that? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so this was, so when I first looked at his journals in, in, uh, in I guess it was 2000, um, the journals were all there, and I read not exclu I, I picked and, and, and chose what I was looking for, and I was looking at first stuff, particularly in 1968, and I didn't find what I was looking for, and then I came back 17 years later, and the journals were no longer there, but there were Xerox copies. And some, I actually know who, uh, one of the Stanford librarians had gone through and with a, a, a black marker taken out all, all of the girlfriends. And I was just shocked. And it made it, it just was a mess. And there was a period where Stuart was between two marriages where there were quite a number of girlfriends. And um, so uh, I went to Stuart and said, did you know about this? And he didn't know about it. And so of course he was close to the head librarian at Stanford. So he inquired with the head librarian at Stanford who also didn't know about it. And I never did get a completely clear statement of why, Stuart, uh, why Stanford did this. Um, they, they said they were protecting Stuart. Um, and maybe they were. Uh, anyway, so they c now if you went into the library, the journals are back. And I should say, in the interest of disclosure, I'm a faculty member at Stanford and very involved in the, in the library, so. Are you on the library board or something? Uh, yeah, yes, um, so <laughs> after the cameras are off, talk to me later, I'll tell you the whole story. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and the other. Well, so, you know, in terms of Stuart Brand's scholarship, uh, in, in 2017, after I started, Stuart still has kind of a, a, an amazing storeroom at Gate 5 Road where he, he still works. He's been on the Sausalito waterfront since the early 1970s. And at one point he went back there and gave me this other journal. And it was actually a separate journal that was kept of one project. And the project was something he did in 1967 uh, when he uh, moved from San Francisco down the peninsula and um, his, uh, his mentor at that point was a man by the name of Dick Raymond. And Dick Raymond, uh, who, who was an ur ur urban planning economist who had been at SRI, set up what I would consider to be the first uh, incubator in Silicon Valley, yep. Portola, Portola Institute. It has what I think of as a spectacular track record. Two things came out of it, in effect. One was the Whole Earth Catalog, and the other was the Homebrew Computer Club, which is not bad for a single, single incu incubator. Um, but anyway, before the great success of the Whole Earth Catalog, there was this great failure. Stuart spent six months working on an educational technology fair. There had been an earlier uh, similar fair on, at San Francisco State, and Raymond thought it would be nice to do one at the San Mateo County Fairgrounds. And he commissioned Stuart, and Stuart got some friends who had been uh, San Francisco State students, and they, they spent six months with his first wife. Um, uh, he, he, he began to try to organize this. They put together an impressive fundraising proposal, shopped it to a bunch of foundations. And the striking thing in terms of Stuart doing things early, um, the striking thing about the document, if you read the document, it reads exactly like the Maker Fair, which actually appeared at the San Mateo County Fairgrounds 40 years later. Stuart wasn't in, involved in that, but he sort of, he saw that early on too. But what was striking to me um, in that account of this failed project uh, was, first of all, um, you know, Silicon Valley was named in 1971. Everybody in 1967, all of, particularly all of Stuart's friends, were heading off to form communes and go back to the land. As a matter of fact, Stuart spent two or three weeks on Lama, which was one of the early communes in New Mexico, and he was deadly bored, decided he wasn't a rural person, and uh, he and Lois Jennings came back. And there's this passage in this, in this uh, journal that's just drop-dead striking. He, he writes... I've decided to come here to Menlo Park to let my technology happen here. So how is it that someone four years before Silicon Valley sort of got its name and became a place, realized that it was the right place to be, and Stuart ended up at ground zero? So th that's one thing. He and, and Stuart has done that again and yeah. again and again. He's an unerring instinct about zigging when everybody else is zagging. That's so right. And we what's can, his secret? We, well, we, let me talk about that in a second, but I just wanted to tell you there was, there's more in there. And it caused me to really reframe the way I looked at the relationship between the catalog and Silicon Valley. 
and uh, so there, you know, I had written a lot. I was fascinated by the fact that Stuart Brand had run the camera when Doug Engelbart, who invented the mouse and hypertext, and much of the technology that would later be evolved to Xerox Park into something called the Alto, and then borrowed, if you excuse the word, by Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, and is the way we compute now. They stole it fair and square. <laughs> so, so, so Stuart was much closer to uh, Doug Engelbart and Engelbart's group than I realized, and that all comes out in the journal, his relationship. And by the way, I just have to interrupt you there, because this is one of the things I love about the book, that like many people in this room, that we've all been steeped in all of this and know many of the people mentioned the book. You've gotten in under all the stories everybody told. We've all known that story forever that he ran the camera. Yeah. And it turns out that actually he didn't quite run the camera and there was so much more depth to it. Yeah, the camera was a footnote as it turned out. I thought the camera yeah. was very significant and it was in the sense that Stuart was there at creation. You know, he saw this, but it was his relationship. So the subtitle of the Holder's Catalog is Access to Tools. And if you ask Stuart, where did that come to? He'll say, well, I was just channeling Buckminster Fuller. And of course, Fuller is the one who said, if you want to change the world, give someone a tool and teach them how to use it. OK, that's very clear. But what you see in the journal from his uh, connection to Engelbart and his group is at the same time, Engelbart was working on building the universal tool, the personal computer. And Stuart was very aware of that. He was aware of scaling, which was a big Engelbart idea that we were going to have this increasing, uh, exponentially increasing. And we should note for the record that what we call Moore's Law, Doug Engelbart articulated uh, yeah. more than a decade earlier. Uh, uh, half a decade before Moore did, actually. And actually, Moore was in the audience when Engelbart. That's another story in another book. But um, <laughs> come for part two of this interview. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, but so the important thought here that really sort of turned my mind around. So, in, 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 in 2016, in, in when, when Trump was elected, in 2017, there were two books that were published. Um, one was Franklin Foyer's World Without Mind, and the other is Jonathan Taplin's Move Fast and Break Thing. They both start with biographical descriptions of Stuart Brand. How is that? Well, it's kind of they were on the hunt for the original sin in Silicon Valley. So, what had happened is that, you know, Silicon Valley had gone from being able to do no wrong to being able to do no right in a very short period of time. And uh, all of a sudden, sort of, you know, there was this search for the original in, in um, Foyer's idea, uh, telling of it, it was, you know, Stuart was the first digital utopian. Um, uh, Taplin was a little more sophisticated. He talked about sort of the, the break in, the cultural break in the valley between the original utopians, he called Stuart a utopian, and the PayPal mafia who came, who were the digital libertarians, which I actually subscribed to. But the point was that there was this sense that somehow there was a through line from the whole earth catalog to Silicon Valley. Right. And in seeing this journal, what I realized is everybody's got it backwards. The, the, the catalog was actually an outgrowth of the same forces that created Silicon Valley. And in fact, it had this impact on this, you know, an entire generation. You know, people put the catalog in the context of being this sort of barnacle, back to the land counterculture thing. It took this perspective about tools, which was you, utopian or not, it was technologically optimistic. It was pre-digital, but it took that perspective and pushed it out into the culture in the late 60s and early 70s, and it had a, I can't tell you, while I was working on the book, I tell people I was, I was working on the book, and you get two answers from people my age, they would invariably tell you about something they s stumbled on in the catalog that sent their life off in a different direction. And then there was this blank, and then there was a second group of people who saw Steve Jobs talk about Stuart Brown in 2005, and they had sort of learned about the catalog through that. But clearly, it had this significant, I mean, the way Kevin Kelly de describes it is it basically gave a generation permission to sort of reinvent their own lives. And it was much broader than people who were going back to communes. It was, it was everybody, you know, there were three million copies sold in those three years, and you, you know where it sat. It sat in living rooms and bathrooms, and everybody read it. Um, and, and, it and, and I got the sense that sort of that notion that the, the, the catalog was this original document that led to technological utopianism is just completely backward. Well, the other thing that uh, always people get wrong is they refer to, from time to time, Stuart as the Zelig. Of, <laughs> of, of the last half century showing up just when things happen. And, and you do a very nice job in the book dispelling that. Well, uh, yeah, gets there early. and I'm also the first person to call him Zelig. I know. Well, <laughs> this is what we call redeeming for original sin. <laughs> um, 
It's, it's sort of like I noticed in the book where you, you mentioned the New York Times broke the story of the World Wide Web, and it's in the very back in six point type that it was <laughs> your story. I, I think that's the media covering the I media or something. Keep, yeah, I want um, so he's not Zelig. No, no, I thought, so the reason I didn't like Zelig on further reflection, you know, I, I said he was Zelig-like because he did show up in all of these places, but, you know, the, the Zelig notion, one of the definitions of Zelig's is a shapeshifter. And, and Stuart, if you want to understand Stuart and his motives, when he was eight or nine years old, he took something called the Con Conservation Pledge. He was a kid who was growing up about an hour's drive uh, outside of um, Chicago, but he summered at this, uh, this beautiful, pristine lake in the center of Michigan called Higgins Lake. And it was a, it was a very Hemingway-esque sort of boyhood in a way. I mean, you know, it was like Walloon. Uh, Hemingway did the same thing. He was near Chicago and he went up to this. And, and uh, so the, the, the um, conservation pledge was this commitment to protecting the resources of the country as an American citizen, its water, its air. Um, and, and Stewart has held fast to that. I mean, he can still s cite that uh, pledge from memory. And it actually, if you, if you look at his life, it is the through line that holds everything together, which I think probably I've tried. How about this, a high IQ Forrest Gump? Would that work? <laughs> Uh, it works for me. I, I actually think of him as a, what anthropologists call a cultural broker, someone who has a foot in two different worlds and spends his time explaining one world to the other. Um, but you mentioned the convert conservation pledge, and Stuart over the years has described himself as a conservative. And some people will say, very strange conservative, but I, I think, as you note in the book, he says that you know, he reads the Wall Street Journal except for the editorial page. Well, he can't read the Wall he, he, he can't bring himself to read the Wall Street Journal because of the editorial. Because the editorial. It hor horrifies him so much. Yeah, so what kind of a conservative is that? But, it, but it, is he a conservative in the sense of the word conservation? Yeah. Yeah, there, there is this tradition. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a grand debate in, uh, or, a, you know, a dichotomy in the American conservation movement going all the way back to Pinchot and Muir and people like that, where there are the preservationists and there are the conservationists who basically argue that you know, we're part of this environment and we're in charge of caring for it and protecting it. And that was, you know, and I, I grew up as, as a Sierra Club, I grew up on the preservation side of the, of the coin. And so it was Yeah, no, we know you're a, you know, <laughs> a cup-carrying lefty. But yes. it's a, you know, it's interesting you say it because I think of the people in Stuart's life, you don't mention him in the book, but Roger Kennedy who was head of the Research. National Park Service, Research. was an Eisenhower Republican uh, early in his career and very much out of that same milieu. And you could see the connection between them. Yeah. Uh, and there's the argument about the hunting community. You know, the hunters have become this force for environmental protection. Yeah. So I'm checking our time. We're about 35, uh, about 35 minutes left. So uh, write on your cards and someone will come pick them up. Did they hand out cards? Oh. Oh, here they come. Uh, but this is good. Uh, it gives me another couple of minutes because I, I have to share him with you is the rule here. <laughs> um, building on the, you know, is he Zelig? Is it, is he got there early? Um, and, and obviously to me it's, you know, he, it's, it's the, you know, the famous quote that is credited to many people. Um, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And, for him, the best way to, you know, predict the future is to show up and make it happen, even when he's not sure. What would be your advice to future stewards? This is an inspiring book. So, so Stuart, um, and he became that kind of a role model for people. I think in some ways he still is a role model even now, I mean, he's been kind of adopted by a new generation of Silicon Valley technologists and entrepreneurs, and I mean, actually come and seek him out um, because of his role. Uh, you, know, you know, I think th this gets back to this notion of how is it that Stuart showed up at the right place at the right time? And I, we had this conversation several times, and I don't think he has, he doesn't have an adequate answer to, to my mind. Um, uh, most recently when he talked about it, he, he talked about something he learned in school, in high school, I think, probably at Exeter, that um, you know, he couldn't compete. 
And so the way he competed is he went someplace else. He, you know, you find the open field and go you run to space. it. Go for the white space. Yeah, go for the white space. And he did that repeatedly. And he did it about five-year intervals. He learned very early on that he's good at starting things. Um, he tends to get bored. Uh, half a decade is kind of the, the metric. And, you know, he did it over a long period of time. And uh, he would just... And, you know, the other thing is it, he, he followed his interests. I mean, it was completely sort of, uh, I, I don't want to say self-absorbed, but he would follow his, his whims. So, you know, uh, sometimes a great notion. Uh, he had many notions, and a, com a couple of them uh, were actually spectacular. And uh, the other th part of the, the well, chemistry... Let me test an idea on you, as you were just saying that, because, you know, it's really easy to say, you know, go for the empty places in the white space. You know, that's how people die and run out of water. <laughs> um, <laughs> is there another, I mean, the other piece of Stuart is that he has, has, has always had a knack for cultivating community, finding the right people to talk to. And is it that he goes into the white space with friends? Well, he's done that systematically. Uh, he calls it his guild, and I, I believe you're a member of his guild. He, he has cultivated a group, a sort of a brain trust, uh, over a long period of time and, and uses them as a sounding board for, for his various notions. Yeah, now, by the way, this is, even though this is California, this is not a cult. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, he, he actually, you know, that's actually probably one of the more impressive um, aspects of Stewart's uh, sort of career is he has a really good uh, cult detector sense. I mean, he was on the edge of the pranksters, but he prided himself as being an off-the-bus prankster because he sort of saw Kesey as that part of Kesey that was a cult leader. That's interesting because earlier on you, you said he was, um, I forget how you used it, but uh, saying not like a shaman, but he really is he lives on the edge of things. He, he, he does. He's, he's, he, he walks away from things and tries exactly. to Exactly. So he launches things and, and, and not intentionally walking away, but walk, you know, it, in the case of the well, uh, there are a lot of people who would have really suffered a lot to lose their baby. Yeah. Um, you know, think of how many, well, Doug Engelbart's a case in point gives birth to this wonderful intellectual baby and wants to let it grow up and go see the world, but he won't let it out of his arms. And Stuart seems to be someone who's happy to start something and after a couple of years, let it go play in traffic and yeah. see whatever happens. There's another piece to the chemistry, which I think is, uh, is fortuitous. Um, you know, Stuart, when I first started talking to him, told me he had upper class roots. And in fact, he does have upper class roots pretty directly. I mean, it, he comes from Michigan wealth, but it's more complicated than that. When I went to see his, his home in Rockford, Illinois, um, they live on Hall, Harlem Boulevard, which is a perfectly, or the family home was in Harlem, perfectly middle class street. The, the grand homes of Rockford were one block over, and they were on the river. And in fact, the Brand family had bought some property upriver where they were going to build their grand home. But the kids' education took priority. And if you, if you were, as we did, we went into it, we just walked up and knocked on the door and visited Stewart's home and surprised the people who were living there because they didn't know that he had <laughs> grown up there. They were very nice and let us wander around in their, in their home. And, but it felt, it felt like just a, a very straightforward middle-class home. So what I wanted to say is after he got out of the Army, uh, the army he came back to North Beach because he was attracted by the Beats. And of course, the Beats were just vanishing in 1962. He was able to sort of follow his choice of careers, try to become a freelance photographer initially, and then do all these different things because he was wealthy in what I came to see as an as-needed way. Um, throughout the 60s, his mother would send him 50 bucks or 100 bucks when he needed it. But it was just enough to get by. And if you saw, I mean, Stuart had none of the trappings of wealth. He lived in a, a, a uh, 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 he lived in a, a, a rundown, uh, soon to be uh, basically condemned uh, apartment in North Beach for fifty dollars a month. I love that part of the book where he goes from a, f a flea-ridden uh, barge, <laughs> barge to, yeah. to a condemned building, <laughs> and, and thinks nothing about cutting an extra window in the wall. Yeah, yeah. That so was... he can see the stewardess's ankles, as I recall. Oh, thank you, sir. Good. Yes. <laughs> um, I just lost my train of thought. 
Um, but you still haven't given the advice. I mean, is the trite question would be, is another Stuart possible? So I'll answer that. Of course it is. But what do you say to people? Well, I think the, 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 the key thing that you're looking for is to, is to you know, do what you're interested in uh, and do that and repeat, basically. That's a, it's a very simple formula. But not many people do that, actually, in the world. I mean, you know, people are career-driven, and they're, they're, they're in the frame. And Stuart was out of the frame. I mean, he was able to dabble for a decade. And he, sometimes he, he condemns himself for that, that, the period in the 60s where he, he was kind of just, uh, he was by no means a hippie, but he was in this kind of bohemian context in which he was free to follow his interests in every, whatever direction they took him. It, it seems like it's a combination of purposeful and uh, and wandering. So it, I haven't read it yet, but Co Kostler's book, um, Sleepwalkers, he, he basically sort of, there's a similar parallel there in the in the history of modern astronomy, I think. It's a lot of it's Oh, Arthur Kessler. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There, uh, there's, there's this kind of serendipitous path that you can take through things following what's interesting and seizing and, on opportunities. And, and what Malcolm Margolin calls deep hanging out, the that, sense that Something's going to happen here, and maybe I should just observe a little bit. Yeah. Good. So we have, I have good questions, and there's, um, I, I got to think about, uh, <laughs> oh, this is, I'm, I'm going to get to the uh, nuclear power thing, but question, <laughs> this is a good one. Uh, Stuart, did Stuart ever say what he felt about Steve Jobs praising him and the whole Earth catalog in his famous commencement speech at Stanford? Yeah, I, um, so did he ever say what he felt? We talked about it. it you know, it, it was 2005, I think, that he gave that speech. So, it, you know, it was like a decade. 2006. Was it two, sure. Okay, five. 2005. Right. I'm pretty sure it's done. <laughs> You're the biographer. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm right. It's 2005. But um, he was flattered. Um, he basically told Stevie owed him a lunch, I think, and he went down and hung out with him. Um, but, um, you know, I, at Stuart... I, I, his his papers, his archives at Stanford are littered with profiles. Stuart is one of the best chronicled people you could possibly manage in over many decades. And so I, I think he's come to take that as part of the, you know, yeah. part, of the, part of the process. Um, Techno-optimist, sure. But what about anti-environmentalist in the sense that it uh, leading question here suits him to pretend the core environmental movement is anti-tech back to the land slash stupid. So should we start with nuclear power? Sure, let's start with, uh, you know, so he was in the 70s and 80s, he, he basically, he describes himself as being marginally anti-nuclear. And then he followed Peter Schwartz, who he was close to. Um, and, you know, Schwartz had been an SRI. He, Schwartz brought him to Shell, which is another thing we might talk about because Stuart ended up consulting for one of the big fossil fuel companies companies, and he had a defense of that, uh, although, you know, took a lot of heat from the environmental community for doing that. And then, um, for a couple of reasons, um, so, uh, sort of went over and became very pro-nuclear, and he argued, he argues, continues to argue, that um, nuclear is necessary because we have to get off of fossil fuels and we have to get across that chasm quickly. And... Um, we had a lot of discussions about that. I think he's come to the position, he's still pro-nuclear now. Um, there was, you know, there were some really tough times. His book came out in 2009, I think Fukushima was 2011. Yeah, it was a little awkward. It was a, more than a little awkward, awkward. He was so traumatized. He was speaking at Reed, and in his mind when we talked about it, he conflated his talk at Reed um, with the actual event. And in fact, he had spoken at Reed two days before the event, but it was, it, you know, it, he really sort of um, had to, to keep his head down uh, because uh, nuclear sort of vanished. And so he now concedes that he was wrong on the pace of solar. He concedes he was wrong on the pace of battery storage, but he's still in that camp that argues that you're going to be able to get this new generation of nuclear that avoids the sins of the past generation and that it will be more distributed uh, this is the debate he had with Amory Levins, uh, and uh, you know. And where I, do you come out on it? You know, I keep thinking, and I'm not an economist, nor, uh, nor really a technologist. I just uh, 
play at reporting about it, uh, th that if you invested the kind of, at the kind of scale that you're going to have to invest in nuclear in other technologies, you could get the, kind of, the, same kind of, um, the same kind of efficiencies and benefits without the, the, the cost. But I, if they can make sp small modular reactors that uh, they can you know, light up cities with, um, and, uh, you know, um, Kim Stanley Robinson spoke at uh, Long Now uh, last month, and, you know, the, the people who are sort of in that process now say, we don't have three decades, we have a decade. Yeah. And that's why now my pro-technology and environmental friends are also saying that's why nuclear is no longer relevant, because nuclear is not coming in a decade. And by the way, you mentioned, if you haven't read Kim Stanley Robinson's book, Ministry for the Future, strongly recommend it. It's, it's, it's also uh, pragmatic and optimistic, which is something in short supply. I don't know, for some reason that in the last two months, I don't know what happened, but pessimism seems to be the new and oh so fashionable <laughs> black. Um, <laughs> you know, what I love is Stuart lives on the edge, but I think what he did for a lot of us is allowed us to live with the ambivalence about nuclear power. And to recognize that, the, I think he's absolutely right. It's the only way to bridge. I mean, especially now with cryptocurrency mining. You know, if we didn't have the crypto miners, we could probably make it with solar. But now we need <laughs> nuclear power. Um, that the ambivalence is that nuclear power is an answer. The question is, can we build human-proof systems? And, um, and so it's fascinating to watch the evolution of his ideas. Um, yeah, when they designed these nuclear plants, they probably didn't take into account tank fire as one of the things you had to... Uh, yeah, yes, it was, first it was tsunamis, <laughs> and now it's, it's artillery. Um, uh, beat Zen. I mean, Stuart was there. Uh, Stuart and Ryan were married at the Zen Center. The question is, does the Beat Zen milieu still affect the Silicon Valley today? Oh, well, I... I I can tell you I know many, and I'm sure you do too, many uh, uh, technologists and venture capitalists and people who are in the thick of the valley who have a Zen, personal Zen practice. I see it all over the valley, so I have to say yes. Um, and by the way, one of, one of the things I love, it's something I use regularly in my work when I'm talking to people, it, is there's, there's a very popular bun, bumper sticker with Zen Buddhists in the valley that right now, and it says, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> and, and I'm coming to the feeling that the, the worst possible thing is someone who wants to change the world. Well, you know, that's, you know, Z uh, Stewart's dabbled in Zen himself. He was around the San Francisco Zen Center, but he couldn't sit there. It drove him crazy. He got bored. Um, <laughs> there was this one summer where he was, uh, he, he actually was building a cabin on the East Coast and his luggage got got lost and he, along with it, was his Zen s sitting pillow. And so he sort of, he was he was he was he was excused from sitting because he couldn't sit on his pillow. Yeah. Um, the here's a question. I'm not, I'm not, I, I think I know the answer, but who are some of the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs that Stuart advises? Well, I so there was this GBN period yes. where he formally did that, and that's I sort of lost in history. I can't name. I mean, he he. He, yeah, the I mean, GBN had relations, you know those better than, than me, had ma relations with many tech companies. And, and the way I think, I mean, GBN was a very strange consulting company and very interesting. Um, but in a way, being a, mem a client of GBN basically meant what you were doing was signing on to a yellow hippie bus being driven through the zeitgeist with Peter Schwartz at the wheel <laughs> and Stewart in the seat behind him with a map telling him where to turn. <laughs> and as near as I could tell, what GBN was about is they all liked to get together and they would find clients who would pay for them to get together and pay for the privilege of sitting in on the conversation. Yeah. So I've wondered, you know, Stewart had about a decade at GBN where he, he didn't sign on completely. He didn't want to do the commute but they gave him, uh, not a sinecure, they gave him a half-time job and he ran the GBN library and he'd show up for events. And he GBN was, Book Club, which has been imitated endlessly after. Yeah, he, he built that and... and um, this is also a case of Stuart likes to be on the edge, not the center. Yeah, but I, I've often wondered whether that was, I mean, it, it's a mixed thing. He did some of his best work. I mean, that was basically, uh, 
It supported him to, to write How Buildings Learn, which is one of the books he's most proud of. Um, but it was also this time where, um, you know, he was, his, his mantra, as, as, uh, as Steve Jobs would tell it, is, you know, stay hungry, stay foolish. He was, that was a period where he wasn't really hungry. He was pretty comfortable during that period. And I've, I've often wondered how that affected him. You know, I'm almost wondering if the advice, if we had him here, the advice he would give to people who want to be like Stuart, is there's this thread starting with his parents that they would give him adequate money to have freedom, but he wasn't, didn't have the curse of a big uh, lump of money where he could just hang out. So he always had to kind of look over the next hill. That's right. And in a way, the GBN relationship, even though he's a co-founder of GBN, what they basically said is, do whatever you want. Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of like getting a fellowship at you know the Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio in Italy without it, the mountains. It gave him a four hundred one k that that, yeah. that that came, that, that came out of it. I mean, in, in response to your, you know, two of the the groups, Patrick Collison at Stripe is one of the tech. Um, Entrepreneurs in the valley who sought Stuart out, the Ethereum folks yep. sought him out. Um, that you, you could see that continues to happen. And and of course, your book only goes up to uh, 2010. Two, I guess it goes that far. I was thinking it picks up the start of Long Now Foundation, but not since. And and Long Now is, in a way, the reconstitution of GBN. Yeah. yeah. To pull in interesting people. Yeah. Um, I love this question. I never occurred to me. Is there an Exeter mafia in Silicon Valley? And you need to explain what Exeter is. Oh, well, you, uh, you, uh, you went to a private school. I didn't. I mean, uh, you know. You I'm from California. No, so, yeah, this is Philip Sandover, Felix Exeter. And yeah, it was an elite pr private school. His brother, he, Stuart, uh, throughout. I mean, it's just like, you know, Prince Andrew would have gone to it if he's an American. It was, it, you know, his, his father first pulled his oldest brother out of uh, his public school uh, in, in Rockford and sent him off to Exeter. And seven years later, he, he set uh, uh, Stuart off. And it, it was because Exeter was known for this particular kind of educational form. I'm forgetting what it was called, but, you know, there weren't lectures. Harkness at Exeter. Method? The Harkness Method. Thank I you. learned this in your book. It's the first <laughs> I knew about it. <laughs> Around a circular table, um, education was a conversation. And his dad was enamored with that. And Mike had gone there. And so Stuart, uh, for many years, up, up through um, the Army, um, followed his, his oldest brother. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because I talked a lot to Mike. And Stuart focused on Mike much more than Mike focused on Stuart. Uh, he wasn't really not, Mike was really not aware of Stuart very much, and Stuart was completely aware of Mike. This is a classic younger brother. Uh, very much so. And there's this, the one, talk about serendipity. So the reason that Stuart Brand ended up at Stanford, well, of course, was because Mike was there. And the reason that Mike ended up at Stanford is he was a, unlike Stuart, his older brother was a football star. And he was a jock, and he was playing sports at Exeter. And he was looking for colleges, and he read something, I think, in Life magazine about a coach at Stanford who had lost every game the previous season, and they didn't fire him. And Mike, who was, you know, had a raised eyebrow about sports, thought, that's the kind of place I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why Stewart ended up there. And it was a close call. He almost ended up at Reed. He, uh, he was almost, to, uh, well, he, almost, he wanted to go to school in Idaho. Um, and when his parents found he wanted to study forestry, um, that was his, his, real, his real commitment. His parents found that out. They got one of his professors, uh, teachers at Exeter to put the kibosh on that. Uh, Darcy Kerwin, who was his English teacher, convinced him that he could go to graduate school in forestry, but he should get a real education first. And he did, he did, uh, he, he, he asked the, he, there's a wonderful document that I found. Uh, he wrote a letter to the, to the, um, the recruiters at, uh, at Reed asking him, um, telling them that he heard their school was kind of pink. And they were very defensive in their response. They said, yeah, we're, we're Well, I think they said, oh, we're better than Swarthmore. No, 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 we're no pinker than Swarthmore. Well, Oberlin, I think it was. Uh, Oberlin. <laughs> yeah, no, three schools, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, as I was reading the book, I, I, I don't quite know how to phrase this, but you know, we talk in Silicon Valley about failure and how failure, interesting failures. And Stuart hasn't exactly had failures, but it's almost like he's had a couple of things he's taken almost to the top of the mountain and, and they kind of hang there and then he goes on. Um, 
you know, it, it, what you reveal about his military career. And he wanted to be a ranger and because of bad weather didn't work out and then got tangled up in the bureaucracy and the like. Is, is, is there something about that? Well, he's, he, he will be the first to admit that he's had many failures. I mean, he doesn't mince words. It's not like almost failures. You know, right. things, things didn't work out. And, um, but they seem it, like they don't work out in the same way, you know, that uh, Walpole's tale of the Lords of Serendip, who every time, you know, that in, in, it, it was serendipitous failure that it sets him, I mean, God help us if he'd become a logger. <laughs> you know, which you know, we might still be using mainframes. Well, he he struggled with. I mean, he wanted to be a novelist at various points in his life, and you know, decided he really didn't have. And he sure had a lot of articles rejected. The well, early on, he had yeah. some. I mean, his early efforts as a journalist. But on the other hand, his first published, significantly published piece in the Rolling Stone, which was the, was the article on space war, sort of nailed it, and then it, it affected it. I mean, that's how I learned about modern computing. Um, you know, I read that article, and that was the first hint I had that there were these new kinds of computers and networks on the horizon. Two cybernetic frontiers? Well, then the book, yeah. The book. And uh, it was in the book that he coined the phrase, um, he was the first person in the modern sense of the word to use the term personal computer. Um, and that was an afterword to, he, uh, Two Cybernetic Frontiers, which was his first book, was a gift from Random House, who was so over the moon with the success of the Whole Life Catalog, they gave him a gift, and he took, an article about Gregory Bateson from Harper's and the Rolling Stone and packaged them and wrote, wrote it afterward. I'm, I'm checking the time. If you have more questions, uh, uh, wave, wave your hands and they will come and be magically transported to, to me. Um, and then I'm going to ask a favor. Um, what are you going to talk about? Um, so this is an OK Boomer question. Um, the catalog is so iconic that once the boomers pass, who said we're going to pass? Um, <laughs> what <laughs> we are going to be around forever to annoy the millennials. Um, uh, but back to the point: what relevance will the catalog have, and Stewart's legacy have for this and future generations? Well, that's a, that's an intense question. So a couple things: um, when it won the. When it, when it uh, won the National Book Award in 1972, um, the, 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 it set off a, a debate amongst the judges, and one of the judges actually resigned because he thought that the catalog wasn't a book. And another one of the judges said, you know, in 100 years from now, uh, the only book that will be remembered from 1971 is the Whole Life Catalog. And I think that actually might be true, that it, it will have sort of an iconic rep, rep, reputation. But what was the, the other component of that? Uh, oh, Stuart's reputation, what was Stuart's legacy? Legacy for future generations. Yeah, so that, that goes right back to, the, you know, the first thing that Stuart did that gave him any kind of visibility. Um, <laughs> the first thing he did that gave him was, was this notion that he came across while he was sitting on his apartment rooftop in the afternoon one March in uh, San Francisco, um, wondering on a half a tab of acid why there hadn't been a picture of the whole Earth. I mean, we'd been in space for a decade. And uh, he came down and he turned it into a campaign. And uh, his point was that seeing the whole Earth would uh, reframe the way we looked at the world. I mean, I think Rusty Schweikert, who was uh, the astronaut who was sort of the first to exit a uh, space capsule, had, had that notion, too, that which I think is particularly germane today, that after you've gone around the, the Earth hundreds of times, those imaginary lines that are drawn on the surface of the Earth mean nothing. And um, I think that that part of Stuart's contribution, the sort of the, the, you know, he, he sees the whole Earth in the, the, in the context of the creation of an environmental movement, but it has this broader concept of planetary consciousness that's worth sort of bubbling up again right now. So I want to explore that. Um, you know, and I think of Rusty's comment about that, that that was echoed fairly soon after the Wright brothers flew in 1910, 1912, was the phrase air-minded in this country. And what was referred to as the winged gospel, that uh, people would fly over the landscape and they would not be able to see national borders and peace would prevail. And of course, it was barely 
25 years later that you know we were using strategic <laughs> bombers yeah. to obliterate cities um, and and also um, as I believe you mentioned in the book I'm trying to remember it's a story I know so well it, it but it, yes it is in the book um, we had already taken a picture of the whole earth when Stuart asked that question and how long was it before we officially had a picture of the whole earth was it what a year or two what 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 you know the history better than I what I believe uh, so I, I, I apologize to cyberspace in advance I'm probably get this wrong I think it was like five years and in fact we had had a classified satellite take a picture of the whole earth and they wouldn't let it out didn't know that history uh. and so the question is if the picture of the whole earth had actually emerged that quickly would that have changed the trajectory of events well so if it had emerged earlier, you mean, if the picture... We had, well, the picture that that famously is on the cover of the catalog is, as I recall, a weather satellite. It's a weather satellite picture, that's right. But there was a classified spy satellite that had taken the whole picture that's earlier, right. and, it, and Stuart himself, I think, only found out about this like 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, so could it have changed history? Well, so the one thought about that that's kind of interesting is, that, so, so Stuart, in the way he tells the story... Um, you know, the mythic story is he had this sort of insight while he was sitting up on the roof. But like many other things that Stuart's done, I found evidence that it had actually happened a couple of years earlier, even for student Stuart. He was he was back in Washington, and uh, he was in a um, I think he was secretary of um, the Interior's office, uh, and he found a draft copy of LBJ's inauguration speech in which LBJ was quoting Carl Sagan talking about a little blue ball and how it would change our perspective when we could see it. And Stuart had underlined that. So I know that he was thinking about that at least two or three years before he was sitting on the roof. Um, so Stuart w was on to the... the it seems like he does two things. One, he's often the first person to see something in the white space that's important and note it, but also to put it in focus in a way that others wouldn't. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, that, that, I think so. It, 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 he, he, you know, uh, he, he, he said to someone at the Santa Fe Institute at one point who asked him, what do you do? He said, I find things and I found things. And he, he takes the most pride in being able to create institutions that are sustaining, and that's why the well, was, you know, which, he, which he considers a failure, was such a disappointment to him. Uh, yeah, but I think it's what is the term in Silicon Valley is a success failure. Yeah, that yeah. it yeah. it went yeah. on and had huge, there are huge, huge impact. But let me put a sharp point on that whole Earth thing. I mean, your book is really about a half century of transformation, and Stuart was at ground zero and one of the agents of the transformation, and certainly spread it around. That have we seen an image of the whole Earth yet or not? Is is a really powerful myth, and and it's a myth that's real. You know, I mean, if, I, I, without if Joseph Campbell was here, he'd put it better than me. The question is, can a myth change the world? Well, I, so th what's, what's horrifying to me right now is I just spent, you know, you know, two or three years talking to Stuart about the transformation in terms of symbols. And the importance of the whole earth is it's really the only symbol of, of all of our symbols that's a, that's a symbol that unifies the entire species. Um, everything else, all the other symbols we have, you know, put us into clubs and divide us. And that was... So what, how's that unifying the species going? Well, uh, well, so that's what, I was, that's what I was getting to. So all of our conversation had been about how significant it was that the image of the whole earth supplanted the previous image of the 50s, which was an image of the mushroom cloud. And I didn't think we would be where we are right now. And so I'm still trying to, to think through... Uh, you know, you know, uh, that, that, that next transition, which you're asking about, I guess. So I want to come back to that, but there's one other question here that we just have to, uh, well, there are actually two questions, uh, and I'll save the one for very last. But this one's, what's the most surprising thing you found in the Stanford archives? 
Uh, well, so it was clearly the lost, well, it wasn't in the archive. The, the so, lost book. Yeah, the, my favorite thing. So I, well, tell Mike Keller, head librarian at Stanford, <laughs> university librarian, that the most interesting thing in the Stanford archives <laughs> well, is well, not in the Stanford It is archive. now. I, I actually personally hand carried it to the library, so it's there. But uh, my fa I can't, I have to, sh I'd have to show you this. My, my favorite letter was uh, a 1964 letter that Stuart got from Ansel Adams. Uh, he'd shown him his portfolio uh, that, he, that he took when he was uh, at the Warm Springs Indian Reservation, and uh, Ansel Adams just raved about his photography. And if I had gotten a rave from Ansel Adams, I might have ended up trying to become a photographer. So, yeah, no. Uh, so I have one last question in this last couple of moments. I wonder, do myths work? But the other one... That this last half century that you document the arc of this book, it's the biography of transformation. But, you know, events in the last two months have made me wonder, is the transformation real or is it an illusion? And I, and I have this thing on my desk that um, it's a Rand bomb damage computer. These were, you can imagine Daniel Ellsberg carrying one of these in his shirt pockets while he's doing war games. And it's, it's, it's basically for calculating circular error probable of uh, nuclear explosions, air blast. It's basically a, a mega death calculator. Um, and a year ago, I would have just thought of this as a wonderful antique on my desk. And I've caught myself in the last few weeks looking at it, thinking, should I be putting in megatonnage? <laughs> um, you know, yeah. here we are 60 years after Stewart started on his journey. And we're right back to talking about things we talked in the depths of the Cold War. And we've had decades of climate change understandings, and yet we're talking about 40 to 7 degree, 70 degree temperature variations in the Arctic. So was this so, transformation an illusion? And we have a, you have a minute to answer. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to take a minute. But actually, you know, I, my first book, I mean, I'm not a starry-eyed optimist all the time. Uh, many, much of the, my, my first book was The High Cost of High Tech, which I wrote with Lenny Siegel, which was sort of subtitled The Dark Side of the Chip. So I'm not always an optimist about technology. Um, but I think Stuart has convinced me, and it, it really was this interaction I had with him over a couple of years, that there's a value to optimism. And maybe optimism is now more important than it ever was. And that takes us right to Kim Stanley Robinson, well, as the saying goes, pessimists are usually right, but optimists generally get more things done. <laughs> so. Okay, last question, uh, uh, and then I will do a close here. Um, when does volume two come out? <laughs> I hope I'm around to write You've it. You've already got 50,000 words. <laughs> I, yeah, I hope I'm around to write it. That'd be fun. Good, and we'll save who he's thinking about the next book for after the session's over. Um, that is most certainly all the time we have for today's program. And I want to thank everyone who joined us in the audience here in person and also online for uh, what I think was an absolutely fascinating program. And uh, John, also, we have copies of the book out there, so be sure to pick up a copy of the book if you're so inclined and um, wherever you purchase books. Um, and this program and other programs like it uh, will be on the Commonwealth Club's website shortly. So thank you again for joining us, and this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.